This video was sponsored by AG1. In this video, I'm gonna get on a plane, I'm gonna fly south of Maine, and I'm gonna build with a guy named Zane. Actually, his name's Sean, and he got really upset when I kept calling him Zane. I don't know why. Twice a year, we run a contest over on our Patreon account where some lucky winner has a chance for me to come out to their shop and we build together. You get $1,000 in prize money, I show up, we build whatever you want. I'm there for a week. We just hang out and we build cool stuff. So that's this video. We build an awesome miter station. Check out the link in the video description if you want to sign up for Patreon and maybe we'll come to your shop next time. Video. You know, this morning, <laughs> we're doing the Patreon drawing. What if I pick a uh, axe murderer? Okay, the winner is, all right, you know what I'm gonna do? Here, instead of just reading it off to you, because you guys all said you have your phones, how about, now here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna call the number. Whew, are we ready? Whose phone is gonna ring? In three, two, one. Hello. Hi, is this Sean? This is. Hi, Sean. This is Jason Hibbs with Bourbon Moth Woodworking. Oh, no kidding. How are you, man? I'm good. How are you? I'm well, thank you. What's hey, going on? Well, I just drew your name out of this bucket for our Patreon contest. Get out of town. Did you really? I really did. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah, where are you um where are you located? We're out. Uh, Massachusetts, and kind of uh, it, up near the New Hampshire border. Oh, about an hour outside of Boston. About this, my wife will be through the moon. Okay, so cool, man. It'll be a good. It'll be a good time. I, this is great, fantastic, awesome. Well, cool. Well, I will be in contact, and dude, I'm excited to get to know you better, man. You too, Jason. All right, cool. We'll talk soon. Later. Hi, my name is Sean McDonald. Uh, I am 54 years old, and I am from originally from uh, Shirley, Massachusetts. It's a great community just south of southern New Hampshire. Great little New England town. Uh, it doesn't get any more New England picturesque uh, than this. My father who was a, a wonderful man, a renaissance man, um, could really do anything. So in 1967, he bought, uh, he and my mother bought a farm out in Shirley, Massachusetts, and the farmhouse had burnt down, but the barn was still freestanding. I spent, I tell people, I spent the first 20 years of my life building that barn into a house. So there was always tools and wood around, and as he got older, he got more into kind of the finer woodworking and furniture making. So we would make kind of shaker style beds together or, or chests. I really learned from him. And then as I grew older and went to college, that kind of went away for a long time. And it wasn't really until we kind of bought this place in Townsend that we've had the room retool and dust off the skills and um, start again, yeah. I'm Dan Falvo, originally from Manchester, New Hampshire, through West Long Branch, New Jersey, living in East Haddam, Connecticut, and I'm 56 years old. How did Dan and I meet? We both worked for a company called American Furniture Rental. Certainly had a lot in common. Um, he was uh, a horrible boss, but a great guy. So outside of work, we're brilliant. Uh, but uh, yeah, so we got together. Uh, we had some common interests in woodworking being among them. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so we've enjoyed uh, doing that for the past several years. So for me, I was, I was in my teens. It was my first summer job. I uh, worked for uh, Tommy Nungesser down in Ocean Township, New Jersey. And I started off just, you know, cutting boards, coasters, stuff like that, small tables. I, I, I do use the E word. I use some epoxy. I'm going to say that quietly. No, I'm sorry, man. I love you, buddy. 
I very much like the arts and crafts shaker style kind of uh, stickly type of aesthetic um, and I've built a lot of stuff in that style. The, the person who owned this place before was obviously a woodworker and made these beautiful boats in here. But but if my wife watches this, what we really need to say is we're going to finish the yes. bookshelves in the library as soon yes. as this thing is done. And that's way, why we built this, what right. we're doing, so we could finish yes. that. And, right? the, and the raised yeah, beds. Yeah, see. We that's, have to that's, finish the raised beds. Uh, we got that, you, Lori. That's my answer. How long have been the raised beds been? Two, <coughs> two years. <coughs> Excuse me. Two years. <laughs> Let's go to Flippin' Massachusetts. We flew in on a Friday afternoon. It was sunny, I was overlooking the bay, and Craig was fast asleep. When we got there, you might think based on this video footage that I was pretty excited, but I just really had to go to the bathroom. Flew into Massachusetts last night, rented a car in Boston. We drove about an hour north. Just before we got to New Hampshire, we stopped. Got a little Airbnb, and we are on our way over to Sean's house this morning. Right here it must be. This guy, it looks old. I don't know where to park. In here? I really hope this is the right house so we don't get shot. This is the scary part of any patron build, because you don't know these people. You picked them randomly on the internet, and here's the moment where you think, are they gonna take us in their basement, dismember us, and no one's ever gonna see us again? Did we tell anybody else the address and where we were going? No, I should probably text my wife. Oh, jeez. Hey, oh, man. There he is. Hey, man. What's up? Good, good. Good to see you, man. How's it going? Yeah. Well, let's After meeting Sean, I was 75% sure he was not going to kill us but I was still a little apprehensive as he led us into his shop. In Boston, you gotta fit in. Oh you boy. Gotta, you gotta get some, some merch. <laughs> you guys can fight over who gets what, but like, uh, wow. you gotta fit in when you're in here, so. Okay. Uh, I will say his shop is much bigger than the last time we did one of these contests. If we heard the same shop last time, it would have been like I know, but it was this right here. It was entertaining as hell. But you can literally, you can literally not touch both sides at the same time. We had like a little dilapidated shack out there. I was like, we should just take them out there. Take them out there. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. We've got a screwdriver. And, uh, you know, and how old is this? After getting to know each other for a while, we wasted no time and started measuring out where we would put Sean's brand new miter station. Now you might be asking, why did Sean want to build something for his shop and not a piece of furniture for his house? Well, the reason is simple. Sean and his wife, Lori, bought a house that was built in the early 1800s a few years back, and it needs a lot of work. So instead of building something for his house that isn't done yet, we decided our time would be better spent setting up his shop so that he could build things for the house in the future. So I grabbed my computer and with our measurements in hand, we sat down on the back porch and started designing his new miter saw station. It's gonna be a fairly simple cabinet construction, but we're gonna add a lot of elements that will make this thing a gem to use. So with our design all hammered down, I sent Sean and his friend Dan off to pick up supplies. They assured me they had a great local spot to get quality lumber, and I believed them. While they were doing that, Craig and I headed to the nearby town of Portsmouth, New Hampshire to pick up a few things at a local woodworking supply store. But before we could get there, we found some really good Mexican food. Because when you're at a oceanside town, Mexican food is the thing you get. With our bellies full, we found Festool. Now Sean wanted to incorporate some sustainer storage into his miter saw station and I knew the easiest way to do this was to use the pre-built sustainer drawer slides. So we picked up a few of those. Little did I know while we were doing that, Sean's great local supplier of wood was just a frickin' Home Depot. You're killing me, Sean. But it's hard to stay mad at someone when they throw you a welcome to New England lobster boil, complete with 12 lobsters and a whole bunch of other stuff. Clams, corn on the cob, butter soup. I mean, literally, there's just butter in bowls. I ate it with a spoon, like soup. 
I was told later that you're supposed to dip the lobster in it, but for a brief moment, that was the best soup I ever had. With day one in the books, we arrived on day two, ready to make some sawdust. At this point, I was 85% sure that Sean and Dan weren't going to kill us. Since we spent the day before working on our design, we had a very good cut list to work off of, so we got to work ripping down sheets of plywood into their appropriate sized pieces to put together our cabinet carcasses. After getting all of our pieces of plywood ripped down, we had to modify them slightly. There's a concrete stem wall protruding from the back wall on which we were going to put the miter saw station. So we do have to notch out the back of the cabinets to accommodate for that, as well as notch out the front of the cabinets to accommodate for the traditional toe kick. Luckily, Sean had a bandsaw, so we set up a quick and easy stop using a square, and we notched out every single one of our carcass pieces of plywood so that it would fit over that concrete stem wall. And it would also fit our toesies, you know, for the toe kick. Then we had to rip down all of our parts and pieces for the internal shelves, dividers, and brace accoutrement that you need when building cabinets. Once all those pieces were cut, I started walking Sean and Dan through how I like to construct cabinets. Now when I set my base shelf and cabinets, I like to just cut a scrap piece of wood the same height that I want my shelf to be. That way I don't have to fiddle around with getting it even on both sides. I just glue and tack that scrap piece of plywood right there on the bottom, and that gives me a perfect little lip that I can set the shelf on. As we started adding these brace pieces to all of our carcass sidewalls, we started setting them in place over that concrete stem wall just to get an idea of what everything would look like. Then we had to add pocket holes to all of our brace pieces. So I left Sean and Dan to work on that, and me and Craig went out to the yard and played with Sean's funny looking dog. This thing did not like being played with. Cock a doodle doo. With all of our parts cut and pocket holed out, we were finally ready to assemble our cabinet carcasses. And this is generally how I like to do it. With our two scrap pieces of wood nailed and glued to the bottom, we take our bottom shelf and we just glue it and set it right on top. Once we add a little glue, all you have to do is come back with a pin nailer and add a few nails. No, this is not the only way it's held in place. This is just to hold it until we can get some screws in through the outside, which is what I'm doing right now. First, Sean came through with a countersink bit and pre-drilled some holes, and I followed right behind and added the screws. With that bottom shelf locked in place, we can start stuffing in our upper brace pieces and attaching those with pocket holes. And there you have it, a very basic cabinet carcass that can be assembled in less than five minutes and is also incredibly strong. So after showing Sean and Dan my moves, they started busting out the rest of the carcasses and setting them in place. As you can see, they sit perfectly over that concrete stem wall and fit nice and snug against the back wall. Lucky for us, Sean's floor was dead nuts level, which made installing them a breeze. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Now you'll notice there's a big gap between carcass three and carcass four, and that's because that is where we're gonna put the miter saw. And we didn't wanna build a traditional cabinet box there because we want to be able to adjust that shelf up and down to dial in the height of that miter saw. So I'll show you how we do that part later. For now, it was time to hook all of our boxes together into two separate units. With that done, it was on to the face frame. Now when I asked Sean about finishing this, he said that he wanted it painted. So we're gonna be using paint grade material for the entirety of the build, which means for the face frame, we went with poplar. So we ripped down some poplar to the right width and we started with our styles on the outside. Once we had those in place, we measured for our rails on the top and bottom, cut those to length and added pocket holes to hook them all together into one giant frame. Once we had this frame all glued and screwed together, we took it back over to our carcass and we set it in place. 
Now that the outside perimeter of the face frame was complete, we could start cutting all of our internal dividers and getting them laid out exactly where we wanted them. Once we had fine-tuned those with a little tap-tap here and a tap-tap there, I marked on our top and bottom rails exactly where they needed to land and then carried everything back over to Sean's work table so that we could screw and glue those in place. With our internal dividers securely fastened, it was time to start adding our drawer dividers. Now, the drawer dividers are kind of optional. You don't have to put those in. You could just do an entire bank of drawers. But I think it makes it look a little fancier. And when it comes to shop furniture, you want it to look fancy. So with our face frame all put together, we carried it back over to the carcass and set it in place to make sure it fit just the way we wanted, which it did because we use those long, those long tape things with the measurements on them. Anyways, again, because this is paint grade, we just added a little glue to our cabinet carcasses, set the face frame on there, and attached it with a pin nailer. We'll come back and fill these nail holes afterwards, and you're never even gonna know they were there. We went ahead and made the smaller face frame for the far right box, and as I mentioned, we filled all the holes. And that was pretty much all we did on day two. But it was a good day, and I was happy with our progress thus far. So Sean decided with our hard work that he'd take us out to this awesome local restaurant called The Bull Run. If you recognize that bar behind me, it's because that's the same bar that was in the last season of Dexter. I am now 60% sure that Sean is not going to kill me. But anyways, dinner was delicious, good friends, great food, and afterwards, we found this awesome bridge that was over a river. I just couldn't help myself. I ripped off my shirt and was gonna jump in when Sean was saying, stop, stop, it's not that deep. So instead of just fully jumping in, I decided to swing down and ease myself into it. And you know what? Sean literally saved my life. There was only about six inches of water in that river. I am now 82% sure that Sean doesn't want to kill me. And with that, day two was complete, and it was on to day three. Hey, this video is sponsored by AG1. AG1 is a daily foundational nutrition supplement that supports your whole body's health. As you can see in this video, I'm actually not here. Magically, I'm on the other side of the country. But one thing I don't love about traveling is it's really hard to eat healthy while I'm on the road. I'm talking getting vitamins, vegetables, nutritional foods in my body. That's why I love AG1, especially the AG1 travel packs. It is so easy to take. All you do is take eight to 12 ounces of water, you take a little of the AG1, and you put a scoop in there. Or if I'm on the road, I do the travel packet. I like to add a drop of the vitamin D3 plus K2, stick that in there, and then all you gotta do is screw the lid on, shake it up, and enjoy. The other thing I love about AG1 is unlike other vitamins, supplements, nutritional things, this one actually tastes good, and I know the ingredients are good for me. AG1 is also loaded with a bunch of vitamin C, zinc, functional mushrooms to help support your immune system, which is super important when I'm on the road. So if you guys want to try AG1 yourself, which I highly recommend you do, go to drinkag1.com slash bourbon moth, and they're going to give you guys a free year supply of their vitamin D3 plus K2 and five free travel packs with your first order. So check the link in the video description, place an order, you won't be disappointed, this stuff is awesome, and it really is something that I've incorporated into my daily routine, and I think it's worth its weight in, well, green powder. Huge thanks to AG1 for sponsoring today's video. It was the morning of day three, and boy, did we have a lot to get done today. That morning before we arrived, Sean and Dan very nicely sanded all of the face frames, so our cabinet boxes were essentially ready to go. Now we just had to make it one continuous unit, which meant we had to get our miter saw at the perfect level so that it was flush with our top. We started by connecting the two boxes with our lower shelf, the same way we did on the other boxes, some glue on top of those little supports, this time we used screws so that it was nice and sturdy. Then after doing a little math, 
Using both my fingers and my toes, I measured down from the top of our boxes where we should put the shelf for our miter saw to sit. I added a few little brace pieces and we plopped in our other shelf. Then before we permanently affixed the shelf in place, we set the miter saw on top just to make sure everything was looking the way it should. At this point, Sean was doing such a good job, I thought he deserved a little gift. You know, just to say thanks for all his hard work. We got you a new set of golf clubs. <laughs> oh, oh, man. Oh, that is so nice. Awesome. I just... Are they left-handed? No. That's what I asked. <laughs> nice. Is it? Someone have it. Uh, look at I that. Look at that grip. That is an awesome that is a grip. Did you believe these were just on the side of the road? <laughs> Well, apparently some people are more grateful than others. Anyways, it was back to work. Now we had to continue our face frame all the way along the front. So we added in a few more pieces of poplar and secured them from the inside with pocket screws. Then using our same little spacer pieces we used to set our drawer dividers on the other face frames, we added our middle drawer divider. Speaking of drawers, it was time to install our drawer slides. So I gave Dan and Sean a quick little lesson on how to do undermount drawer slides and set them to work installing brackets. Now normally I use Bloom undermount slides, but Rockler just came out with their own brand of slides and they sent us a bunch for this project. So I was super stoked to give them a try and see how they compared to the Bloom ones. I have pretty high standards when it comes to drawer slides, so I'm gonna be very critical of these if they don't work the way that I want them to. The good news is that they install exactly the same way that the Bloom ones do, just with a bracket on the back that they slide into, and then you just add one screw right into the face frame on the front. Boom, installed. Dan and Sean really couldn't believe it, but it really is that simple. I like to inset the drawer slides about 3 30 seconds of an inch past the front of the face frame just to ensure that the drawer box sits just behind the face frame and not proud of it. So in no time, all the drawer slides were installed and me and Dan enjoyed a nice libation. Now time to make a zillion drawer boxes. Luckily, we had some pretty crappy plywood from Home Depot to do it with. Because we had to cut a zillion identical pieces, I decided the easiest thing to do was to start using the miter saw station before it was actually ready to start using. So we set up a rudimentary stop block and we cut out all the pieces for the drawer boxes. While Dan and Sean sanded, me and Craig had a few errands to run. And we ran them. And they were hard. By the time we got back, all the sanding was magically done. So I walked Dan and Sean through exactly how I like to construct my drawer boxes. It's a dirty, simple way of doing it, but boy is it effective and makes an incredibly strong drawer box. If you'd like a little more in-depth instruction on exactly how I put these together, there's a link in the upper corner of your screen right now. Once the drawer boxes were constructed, we added the clips that came with the Rockler drawer slides and they just clicked into place. I gotta tell you, and I'm not just saying this, I really did inspect them from all sides, and those Rockler drawer slides, they're solid. And they're a third of the price of the Bloom ones, so I just might be making a switch. While I did the math for all our Shaker-style drawer fronts, Mother Nature did the math on what it would take to cause a lot of inconvenience for us as woodworkers because the only way to cut long boards is to open Sean's barn doors and, well, the boards get a little wet as you're running them through the table saw. I was actually really worried that the water was going to trip the brake on the saw stop, so I had Dan use a paper towel to dry the board off as it went through the saw. And, believe it or not, the saw did not trip. After ripping down a bunch of stock poplar for our drawer faces, we set up another rudimentary stop over on our makeshift miter saw station, and we cut out all of the pieces for the faces. Next, we set a dado stack in Sean's saw, and we added a quarter inch groove down the center of each one of our frame pieces, which will eventually house our floating panel. Once all the grooves were cut in all of our pieces, next we had to cut the tenons on our rails that would fit into our styles. 
So we used Sean's little crosscut sled thing he had backwards, because technically it's supposed to be on the other side of the blade, but it wasn't going to work that way for some reason. But I digress. Anyways, we managed to get all of our tenons cut in the end and all of the frames for every single one of our drawer faces were ready to be glued up, which meant that that was a great stopping point for the end of day three. So we headed indoors where Sean's mother had made us a delicious meal of pasta with homemade meatballs and sausage, garlic bread, beer. I'm never coming home. It was the morning of day four and we still had a lot to do, but the sun was shining, the rain was gone, and we had MDF to rip down for our floating drawer panels. Now you might be saying, MDF? Why MDF? Well, as I mentioned before, Sean wants to paint this, and whenever I'm doing paint grade drawer faces, I always use MDF, because it paints great. And, well, it's easy to mill. After cutting all of our drawer face panels to the right size, we added a nice rabbit on all four sides. Now this is half inch material, and by adding a rabbit on all four sides, it'll allow us to have an inset panel on the front, and it'll be flush on the back, which means that mounting those drawer faces to our drawer boxes is much easier, because, well, it's all flat on the back. Kind of like Craig. I mean, that guy's flat from the back of his head to the heels of his feet. Just straight line, all the way down. It's pretty amazing. Anyways, with all of our panels cut, I showed Sean and Dan how I like to stick them in the frame with a little glue here, a little glue there, and I even taught Sean and Dan how to use my patented glue spreaders. They were pretty impressed. They didn't even know they had them on their body their entire lives. So with all of our drawer faces in clamps, we moved on to cutting down MDF, this time for the top of our work surfaces. No, it's not just going to be MDF, but this MDF will act as the substrate on which we will add a nice laminate surface. Formica to be exact. I love using Formica for work surfaces because nothing sticks to it. It's durable and it's very smooth and easy to maintain. But obviously Formica just sits on the very top of the surface, so I always like to face all the sides of my substrate with a hardwood like hard maple. But Sean didn't have any hard maple, so he took me to a local lumber supplier. What the heck, Sean? Why didn't we come here instead of flipping Home Depot? This place is awesome. But that's neither here or there. The boxes are built. The drawers are done. Just move on, Jason. Move on. Now the hard maple we purchased was rough sawn, which meant we had to mill it up first. Luckily, Sean had a really nice joiner and, well, I mean, he had a planer, technically, if you wanna call it that. I mean, it did get the job done eventually. I mean, it also left these crazy rust marks on one side of the board, but hey, we got it thinned down and we were able to mill up our maple and set to work facing out our MDF tops. To face out our MDF, we didn't do anything fancy. We just did mitered corners where all the pieces came together, added a little glue and attached them with pin nails that we would fill later. We were very careful not to glue or nail our tops to our boxes yet because we wanna be able to take them off. And I'll show you why here in just a second. After getting all of our maple pieces attached to our MDF, I had Sean sand the maple perfectly flush with the MDF so it would make it very easy to add our laminate. Speaking of laminate, when we were talking to Sean before coming out, we asked him what color laminate he would like us to get for the tops. I told him, we work with Formica. We can literally get any color you want. The sky's the limit. His response was, I don't care you pick. I said, are you sure? He said, yeah, pick whatever you want. I couldn't care less. Oh, Sean, you stupid man. Get over here, get over get here, over here Dan, on. take a look. It's, a, it's industrial gray. Now you guys yeah. said you didn't care. I said it would be impossible for me to care any less. less. Okay, so we worked with the people at Formica. They were very nice and they made a little custom design. Nobody else has this. This is the only one in the world like this. 
At this point, I'm 10% sure Sean's not going to kill us. Oh, oh dude, that is f awesome. Oh, sorry. Some kind of special. <laughs> it's special. That's that's the word I'm going to use. It's it's special. You ready? There it is. Oh my god. <laughs> I absolutely love it. That's so perfect. <laughs> well, Sean, a word to the wise. If someone ever asks you what color you want something, just pick a color, man. Or live with my face on top of your workbench for the rest of your life. You choose. After getting over the shock of our laminate choice, we started scoring and snapping our pieces of laminate to fit on top of the work surface. It was really weird. We had extra laminate and Dan took it out and put it in his car. I mean, I don't know Dan, and that stuff's got my face all over it. At this point, I was starting to think Dan might be the one to kill us. Now when I cut laminate to size, I like to overcut it so that it overhangs my work surface just a little bit, and then we'll come back and we'll trim it down. We were just about ready to start adding our contact cement when Lori brought us out the biggest shrimp cocktail I've ever seen in my life, which is perfect when you're dealing with toxic chemicals. I decided to just mix the two together and see how they tasted and uh, Now it was time to actually attach the laminate to the MDF substrate. So we applied contact cement to both the underside of the laminate and to the top of the MDF. The great thing about contact cement is you just put it on and wait for it to dry. This can take a little while, so while we were waiting, we decided to go outside and have ourselves a little pickup game of baseball. You're looking at the fourth grade little league champion first baseman right there. And I don't mean Craig. Once all the toxic fumes were cleared out of Sam's shop and the contact cement was good and dry, we added some dowels to the top of the work surface to lay the laminate on so that we could slowly start applying it to the top and make sure everything was lined up. I like to start in the middle and work my way out to each side, just adding even pressure as we go. And once it's all stuck, I come back through with the laminate roller and I add some good solid pressure to permanently bond the two surfaces. Then, because we left the laminate overhanging our maple just a hair, we come through with a chamfer bit, add a nice chamfer to the edge of all sides, and this also trims down our laminate perfectly even with our top. And just like that, both tops were covered in the most beautiful Formica laminate I have ever seen in my life. And we were on to day five. It was the morning of day five, the last day of our build. And fortunately, we walked in to find Dan and Sean hard at work sanding the drawer faces we had glued up the morning before. So while they kept sanding, I set to work installing these cool sustainer drawers into the end of our cabinet. By the time I got those installed, all the drawer faces were sanded and ready to be attached to our drawer boxes. If you ever have to install overhang drawer faces, get yourself some of these Rockler drawer face clamps. They make the process so easy. Because it was the last day and we had to get this thing done, everyone was chipping in. Sean, Dan, Lori, me, Craig, we were all out there doing our part to get this thing to the finish line. I cut Dan a small little jig that perfectly fit in the front of each drawer face and made it stupid simple to install the nice black hardware we got for each drawer. So, with all of our drawer faces installed, our hardware screwed on, the last thing we had to do was install our miter saw fence. Now this miter saw fence could not be simpler, and it couldn't work any better than it does. It is by far my favorite way to make a miter saw fence. It's simply a piece of angle iron and a piece of extruded aluminum. I like to set my aluminum fence back an eighth inch from the fence that's actually attached to the miter saw. This way you can run longer boards on there and if they're a little bowed or out of square, you're not fighting them the whole way down your fence. We drilled a couple holes into the angle iron, added some bolts with these little turn knobs and slapped on a custom Bourbon Moth stop block made by J Cats Moses, available on my website. 
Once we had the fence on the left installed, it was time to add the one on the right. I just used a Festool track saw track to make sure it was nice and in alignment with the miter saw. And then last but not least, we added this Sterrett adhesive metal tape measure sticker thing. So you could just reference off of that and you wouldn't even need a real tape measure. They did send us the wrong one for the right side. It was a little too wide, so Sean's going to have to add one over there later. But the important part is this miter saw station is flipping done. And it looks pretty darn good, too. I hope Sean will enjoy this for years to come. When we showed up, we didn't know who Sean and Dan were. But when I left, I had made two new friends. And I'm 92% sure that Sean's not going to kill us. Yeah, so this is perfectly accurate. We got that nailed down. So yeah. you can lock this like right on 17. Okay. And then if you lock it down up here and it happens to be off like you're cut, you need to micro adjust, then you can just barely scooch this back and forth, micro adjust oh, nice. the whole thing. So it's right. done, man. Nice. Yeah, job, that was good. Man. All right, let's start getting this pink painted. Painted? I mean, he can't kill us if he can't find us. <laughs> to think, he really thought we were going to stay there and help him paint. Oh boy, what a noob. Anyways, hopefully you enjoyed that video. I cannot say enough nice things about Sean and his wife Lori and Dan. The hospitality was off the charts. That was so much fun. I absolutely love getting to go experience new places, meet awesome people, and just build in other people's shops. It's so cool. So if you want a chance for me to come out to your shop, make sure you check the link in the video description. It'll take you right to our Patreon page. You sign up, you can enter to win this contest. You get a weekly live question and answers. There's a bunch of behind the scenes content. We give discount codes for the website. Every once in a while, we just give away plans. Other people are paying on them, paying for them, paying on for them, paying for on them. Anyways, other people are spending money on them and you don't have to, we just give them to you. We're like, hey, you want some plans? Take some plans, free plans. Oh, our patrons, they get plans, take them.